Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. This is your proprietor, Tony Ortega. And I'm joined this week again by Trish Conley, who did, who had such a great conversation with last week. How you doing, Trish? Good. How are you, Tony? Uh, last week, um, you and your sister Liz were both on the podcast, and we went over some of your family's history and Scientology, your former third generation Scientologist, close friend of Leah Remini. And at one point, you were the woman I was calling Ellen in our notorious daycare from hell story uh, that involved Julian Schwartz and all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, it just felt like last week we just got going. And I heard so many great things about that conversation, Trish. People were absolutely thrilled that you have come forward and are talking about these issues. Um, so I thought, you know, let's let's keep going, right? Let's uh, let's talk because it seems like yeah. Uh, You've got a lot to say about Scientology. Why not? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I want to go back after hearing from some people, I, I want to go back and revisit a few things to make some things clear, maybe for myself as well. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, third generation Scientologist, you were telling, we were talking last week about how your grandparents had uh, actually met L. Ron Hubbard and had gone to St. Hill to work with him. And then uh, how your, your mom and dad got into it too. But I guess one thing we glossed over a little bit is how you ended up being declared. Uh, and in Scientology, that means declared suppressive. You're you're basically declared an enemy of the church. And once somebody is declared suppressive, everybody else in the church must cut off all contact with that person. Mm -hmm. And I thought, um, since so much comes from that, can you tell us when that was, what was your situation, and what was it like to go through that experience? Because I think we kind of glossed over that last time. Oh, boy. That's such a loaded question. Um, whew, um, it's funny. I'm not, I'm not great with dates, okay? So I know that in 2007, I was considered myself out and you know just not doing anything anymore and under the radar and um and then it was either 2010 or 2013 and I actually can't honestly tell you what it was that I did uh -huh. um it might have been the article with you um with the Ellen story even though my name wasn't on it they probably realized it was me. I don't know. That was know. a little later. That was 2015. Was it? Yeah. Okay. So I was already declared by then. Okay. So what else? I, you know, I asked my dad this, like, what does my declare say? And he was just like, it's nonsense. And it's all this stuff of when you were a kid and, um, and it's BS. And so I, I actually don't know what I did exactly other than, um, I did mention you I, in, in a 2013 yeah. story. Maybe it maybe it had something to do with that. I don't think you were involved. I think I was just, uh, you know, there was something. I think the, when I first mentioned your family history was mm. in a 2013 article. I think it had something to do with Leah. I don't know. Maybe it had something to do with that. Maybe. Maybe it was the photo of the three of us after it said something like 20 years. That's the one. Okay. Yeah. So... You know, I grew up with all these girls uh, in, that were in that photo and we were reconnecting as grown women finally, but to be declared over seeing your friends, <laughs> it's silly. Uh, but that, I guess that was it. Actually, that's it. That must be it. For well, sure. I mean, that Leah's, Leah going public with her defection in 2013 was a big blow to the church of Scientology. And then she posted that photo of you and her and, um, Chantel and, um, Sherry. Right. Lewis. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, I think I then, uh, wrote something about Leah's yeah. not, Leah's not That's backing it. down. She's showing her That's support it. from her friends. And then I yes, ran down yes. a little bit about each one of you. And well, you that... just reminded me of what, what it was that I got declared for. <laughs> Thanks. It's all my fault. Totally forgot. <laughs> I know. Um, 
Yeah. So that's what did it was having um, dinner with old friends. And then do you remember were, how you, you know, heard not about in church it? anymore? Um, wasn't, didn't Leah post that on Twitter or something? Yeah. She posted the that photo. photo? But I'm, I'm wondering how you heard that you were in trouble over it. Oh, well, how I heard that I got declared is yeah. absolutely grueling. It actually had to do with my um, sister-in-law at the time. Um, so my daughter and her son, who are cousins, got into some sort of altercation. Um, and I called my sister-in-law and I said, you know, we got to sort this thing out between our kids. Um, and she said, oh, I can't talk to you anymore. And I was like, what? She said, oh, yeah, I just I just went into the org and read your declare. So, um, yeah, I better not speak to you anymore. All right, you hung confused up the me phone. a little bit there. I thought I you said your 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 son and your daughter were cousins. No, my daughter and her son. My your cousins. daughter and your her and, and her my son. Sis sister in law's yeah, son. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. I, I heard yes. that wrong for some reason. Okay, no problem. But she told um, you she had seen the declare. Yeah, that she had gone into AOLA and seen it and then it was posted everywhere. And that she couldn't talk to me anymore. And then it was shortly after that that I called my folks and was like, I just heard this that I was declared by this, you know, my sister in law at the time. And um, they hadn't, I guess they hadn't heard about it either. But the minute they heard about it, it was um, a big, you know, big situation. And um, and then it was shortly followed by, um, you know, the disconnection letters and have a good life and see you later letters. Wow. You know, and I also think it had to do with back in those days, um, there was a, like, I think my sister and I touched on it. There was like this Facebook police, like you can't openly be friends with other people. Like, even though I grew up with these people, you know, Jojo Zawawi, <laughs> you know that? that name? Do you remember no. that name? No. Oh yeah. She she was an a long time. I think she'd been on the Apollo and she was the nurse ratchet of Facebook, man. She was hunting oh. down anybody that oh. was, you know, liking something about Leah or linking to another ex Scientologist. You would hear from Jojo. It's like, get that person off your friend list now. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, she she when 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 I first heard the term Facebook police, it was in reference to her. So I thought maybe you had heard of her, but never mind. No, there are plenty I, of them, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But to me, it was just like a non-issue. You know, it's like you know, no. <laughs> but yeah, that's how I found out was through my ex sister in law that it had actually been done. And, and then, then did you try to see the declare yourself? No, I I was so. Um, pissed off and I was so upset and in fact um you know at first I was angry just straight up angry and then after a while you you know that because I'm still unraveling from um being raised a Scientologist I'm still thinking with the concepts of like you know I'm PTS, SP, like, you know, all those things, the overt motivator sequence, like all the things I'm still unraveling from. So um, that was a really, really rough time for me. And and then, of course, the people that were still in good standing, all my, the people that I'd grown up with that didn't leave the church, all, you know, disconnected and just that's it. One day you're there and the next day you're not. And, um, and the fam, the, the, the fact that my parents did it again, really cut me deep as, um, how did you hear, of, how did you hear it from them? A letter. They sent your mother and father sent you a letter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a letter. Um, I could dig it up. I don't even want to dig it up, but, uh, you know, it just, it reinforced the trauma of my whole life, basically, Tony, of like them choosing this thing over me, over family, over everything else and justifying it as the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics or their eternal freedom or whatever it is that motivates 
um, these people to blow, like, you know, like it just, it, it hurt a lot, a lot. And I didn't do well for a few years. And so I actually just sort of vanished from all kinds of things and did my own thing for a few years until I could wrap my mind around it. Yeah. And really it was, it was devastating, devastating. And did uh, yeah, I know for some people it affects their ability to make a living. Was it impacting your, your business at all or anything? Um, no, I was a, um, um, I'm an interior designer and I'm also, I was at a full, I was a full-time mom at the time. So that was, she was my priority then. So I had to sort of remove all the distractions to keep providing that safe space for her, you know, which is, I hear a lot of, um, ex-scientologists actually say, I can't believe what my parents did to me when I was nine and put me in the sea I have kids now. And I look at this little nine-year-old and they're babies. Like that's what it's like. You literally go, they're babies. How yeah. could our parents have done that to us? You know? Incredible. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It's and at that time, your daughter would have been about 13, right? Yep. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, um, you know, like I wanted to do Leah's show with, the, um, but I was too scared. And I also thought that maybe if I don't say anything openly anymore, that I could maybe fix my family situation. It's always in the back of my mind, you know? Um, that's, I find that that's always the toughest decision people in your position face is, there's two strategies. Mm -hmm. One is just go loud and in their faces and fight. And the other is just be quiet, disappear. And if you are vanish entirely, then maybe you'll get to see your loved one. And the thing is, <clears throat> I know people who have done each of those and it's worked. I mean, I, I, I never second guess somebody for what they choose to do because I've I know somebody that made such a pain in the ass of herself to the Church of Scientology they finally said here take your son get get a, get away from us and then oh, I know wow. other people that stay really quiet and just do their best and they establish contact so you know it's a tough decision to make for anybody oh it really is and it's um what is it like Sophie's choice, you know? Yeah. Like, how, how, how do you do it? Um, but you know what? I think what I finally realized with this, you know, when my being disconnected completely from my family for six years gave me that time to really unravel my mind, you know what I mean? And start to think for myself again. And, um, went to therapy and that was very helpful. And, and then I was kind of okay with it. I was like, you know, um, I'll just view it as if I've been to their funeral already, you know, and that's what I'm going to have to do because otherwise I cannot put one foot in front of the other with this thing of like, how do they do it? Was how your daughter can they forsake yeah, they're they're you know, and oh, that was the other strange thing. Tony is um, when they were disconnected, they were asking Liz, "Oh, can you get, you know, Maddie's my daughter's, um, you know, number? We want to be in touch with her." And I'm thinking, how dare you? Wow, how dare you? Like because they can't talk to me they're going to go to my daughter who they don't even know i mean the arrogance and the just straight well, that up was, uh, that's what i was going to ask is um <laughs> did they i mean your daughter was already 13 did, they didn't have much of a relationship with her even to not that at all. point not at all not it's, at because all. they were so busy with the sea org and everything that's right Ooh. that's right so um um where was i so, you know, cut to when my sister ended up moving back to Australia, which is, I think, what sparked 
uh, you know, my father reaching out maybe through her, like as a medium, you know, he's not really breaking the rules if he's talking to her through me, you know, and then, um, I uh, one, you know, I just got this call from my sister. Oh, dad's on a plane and, um, he's coming to see you. And I said, what, you know, <laughs> either this is like an OSA op to try and handle me. So you this know, is, an and this is like six years yeah. after you'd been declared because Leah, yeah. when he put a picture of you on the internet yeah, and, um, your parents completely cut off contact with you in a letter Mm -hmm. And now six years later, suddenly he's on a plane from Australia coming to see you in LA. Crazy. Correct. Crazy. Crazy. And at first I didn't know if I could trust him, you know, like, can I talk to him about things? Is it going to be, you know, reported back to somebody? Is this a handling? I don't know. Which automatically makes it uncomfortable because to me, I, I, I mean, everyone wants to have like an organic relationship with family you sure, know sure. just it's just an organic way of communicating you might disagree about things but this Scientology that's always in the middle menacing around in our business <laughs> makes it impossible so um you know we really tried to to um make it work but at the end of the day after those four years of of secretly being in contact and then me flying down to see them or my mother actually, cause I hadn't seen my mother. Um, and I came back just as crushed as I did six years ago. It was just awful, awful, awful. The fact that, you know, I was, we're trying to reconnect as a family and, you know, if Kate would call or, uh, and it was like, shh, go outside, Trish, shh, you know, they you know, it's just like an awful, like I'm your child. I, why? And again, just to, re to remind people what we're talking about is that you had gone to visit your dad in Australia. And when your cousin, Kate Seberano called, mm -hmm. uh, you had to pretend you weren't there. And Kate Seberano is maybe, I mean, she's clearly the most famous Scientologist in Australia. But like you said last week, she's a household name. Everybody in Australia knows who she is. She's very well known. She's not just a singer, but she's also a TV presenter. This is somebody, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure we have lots of celebrities that are sort of the equivalent here in the United States. You know the name, you know the face. And she calls and you've got to go hide. Yeah. That's just crazy. Yeah, it's just, it's an it's just such an awful feeling to know that this this grip that they have is, is interfering with just, you know, our family affairs. And, um, and so, like you said, these two decisions are these, you know, that you hear people trying to figure out when, you know, for the last year, um, my, you know, sister and I, I just was like, you know what, I think we got to cut it off because I can't function. It's so upsetting to me, literally upsetting to me in therapy in my life that my family has been stolen from me by this church well yeah. i was thinking it's kind of unique i mean i know so many people that are just completely cut off never hear a word um then there are some that sort of get some crumbs you know like they'll get a message once in a blue moon and they get excited but then that never goes anywhere um and uh but you, your situation was so odd because your dad kept contacting you and he wanted to talk to you and he kept saying he wanted to reunite. But yes. every time it was always couched in the situation that you have to subjugate yourself to the church. You have to go to them hat in hand. You got to yes. do their thing. And yes. you, and you, you know, that was impossible for you. It's impossible for anybody who decides that they don't want to participate in that church or religion anymore you know um because you do have to abide by their rules which just logically doesn't make sense i know that some people do it to keep the peace and but i just think to myself it's not honest it's <laughs> it's not honest because you're still 
Yeah, it's to get you back, you know, like when you hear these stories of people being held in rooms for hours and signing NDAs and saying everything was wonderful. And if you say that, then you can leave. It's, you know what I mean? It's like, it's just the church, I don't know, just the church protecting itself. It has, you know, um, you know, and when I was having these discussions with my father, um, honestly, I would say things like, you know, um, look at Hubbard. Hubbard's family are all out. <laughs> right. Look at David Miscavige's family. They are all out. You know, like the fact that you are part of this thing that has no value on family at all, yet you want to play happy family with me by me going into your church and to, you know, make amends and whatever. I don't even know what the steps are, to be honest. It's probably disconnect from everybody and do a liability for me, pay some money. And I don't know. I don't know who knows what it is, but it just, you know, it doesn't make sense. Well, you have to so, strike a blow against the enemy, right? Isn't that one of them? You have to... That's correct. <laughs> that's correct. Either way, whichever group you decide. Uh, you know, listen, but... I, I'm, I can almost guarantee you that because we know this from some others that we've talked to, if you went back to Mike Ellis, international justice chief, your only terminal at Scientology yeah. and said, okay, I'm ready to do A to E. I can tell you what A is. What is it? Spy on Leah for us. Oh, right. <laughs> right. Right. Because yeah. that's exactly what others, you know, Mark and Claire Headley, you know, they no. they sued the church. Unfortunately, it, it didn't prevail. Um, it's complex reasons why. But it yeah, was left I, I over that. with uh, it was left over with some legal fees. Right. Like forty thousand dollars in legal yes. fees they owed the Church of Scientology. And Scientology came to them and said, Hey, we'll forget about it, but for this, right? Yeah. They they wanted them to spy on everybody for them. Of course. Of course. So, you know, yeah. and of course they said no and, and they raised the money. It was wonderful, wonderful. They just gave their middle finger to Scientology. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember that. And then exactly. another person I think about is Marty Rathbun. You know, that uh, once he decided to go crawling back and become Dave's attack dog, uh, I got confirmation that some of the emails people had sent to him went back to the church. Wow. So that would be the first thing they'd ask you, Trish, is turn right, over right. all the things Leah has sent to you. And you know, that, that's the crazy thing is that, you know, they're playing these spy games they're not playing the human game. Do you know what I mean? Like we're just connecting because we've known each other or we have some common reality, especially being raised in this group. And it's funny to me that the church just wants to do these, you know, the spy games. Well, you were saying, you were saying to me earlier that, I mean, that's part of growing up in Scientology, right? I mean, as a child, you're learning yeah. that sort of mindset, right? Tell me about that. Well, you're learning to uh, write people up and turn people in, you know what I mean? For, uh, you know, they say things like, um, you know, if you've witnessed something out ethics and you didn't write it up, then you're just as culpable and all those things. So it's a snitch, it's a snitch on snitch um, culture to keep everybody in line and not, actually having open honest conversations like like we're having right now just an open honest conversation whether we agree or not like it can't be done otherwise there's just it's a suppressive act or you know you're going to get tobbed on and then you're going to go to ethics and then you're going to have to buy auditing and then you know you're going to get sec checked and you know it's just you can't win you just you're just I don't, going around in circles. And you were saying that as a child in Scientology, from the get-go, you're taught to lie. Oh, see, this is my big thing, actually. I When I reflected this last year on my family situation, where I, I was able to come to this decision to say, that's it. I don't want to talk to my to them anymore. Um, it's hard breaking as a decision it was 
I remember, you know, my father's family are not Scientologists. None of them were or are. Um, and my grandparents were really concerned about what he was doing with his kids and me because I'm the only like you know I think Liz was explaining I am my dad's only child um my sister and my brother have a different father and they were really concerned and when we got to the United States and you know we're I'm signing a billion year contract and putting on a uniform and working, you know, seven days a week and all these hours as a minor child, like they were concerned. And I remember it's like this sure story, you know, don't just give them the sure story, just tell them you're learning and you're in school and tell them you're happy and everything's lovely and, you know, make friends. And the meanwhile, I'm looking around going, I am miserable this is miserable. I really just want my parents. I just want to go to a home, you know, but you could never say that you got to lie. You've got to lie to not create an antagonistic situation or a PTS situation. So it's like you're trained as a kid to lie. And I remember like being caught telling a lie and getting an ethics for it. But it's like, you can lie if you're protecting the church, mm. but if you lie doing something else, now go. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it does, it's, they don't take their own medicine. It doesn't, yeah, that really um, um, doesn't jive with me, Tony. It just, why? We're, but we're all taught to do that from a very, from the very beginning. And especially if you're born and raised in it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I just find it such a dichotomy that that communication is the universal solvent, but you're not allowed to speak about certain things. You know, you got to lie about certain things. I don't, I don't like that. Yeah. And um, there was something really interesting about you were saying, so your dad's parents were not in it. Right. But they were really concerned about the fact that he was so dedicated to it and it didn't look like he was taking care of you. Yeah. And your dad still had those letters and he actually showed them to you not too long yeah. ago. Yeah. When I was down there, um, my dad, I was telling my dad as honestly as I could, everything I'm saying to you, basically, like I was not happy during that time frame, you know, you're taught to not put N theta on your parents' lines that will get them off of post. So you're just surviving and swimming as a best, you know, staying above water as a child as best you can. And I was trying to explain this to my father. And he said, I always thought you were so happy. Look at all these, um, these cards you used to write me as a kid. And I, he pulled out one card. I must've been like nine or 10 and, it, I drawn a fireplace and a Christmas tree and a family sitting around it, opening presents. And he, and I said, I love you, mom and dad. And he said, see, you just seem so happy. And I was like, dad, that was me saying, I want normal again. I want normal things. You know, that's me crying. That's a cry for help right there. <laughs> And in the box, I was like, oh, what are these? And they were letters from my grandmother to my father saying, we are really, really worried. And I recall them being quite a bit of a problem for my father in the early days because they could have, they were going to cause a stink. So it was always a tell them Trish is in school and tell them, you know, we have a house and Trisha has a room and, and they're all like half truths and, you know, and then, but attached to those letters were my dad's responses with the lies. And as I read through them, I was like, no, that's a lie. So some MAA or somebody was sitting with you as a PTS type a handling, you know, whatever it is to, uh, 
good roads, fair weather, your parents to say that everything's okay. When in fact, it really, really wasn't okay. You know? And um, anyway, that, that really blew up for me because. And wasn't um, he, and wasn't he kind of trying to convince you that he was proud of those letters? Like, look, I did what I could to protect you or something. Yeah. And you know, in my dad's mind, he probably did, but that's what, that's what is um, amazing about all this and every other child or, you know, now adult that tells their story, he grew up, is kind of the same thing, the same story, you hear it. And um, it's the, it's, and I, I, this is going to sound really cringe, but it's like, they're so brainwashed that they can't even see the reality of what is actually going on and when it's actually happening, you know, because it's got to solve the problem, got to make it work, make it go right, clear the planet, um, the greatest good, you know, it just, all the, that rhetoric that comes makes, it blocks the view of what is real, in my opinion, of what's really happening. I don't know. Does that make sense? Am I yeah, just it rambling? Does. It does. And and I, I know what you mean by um, it's like amazing that they can't see what's right in front of their faces. Like um, you also had mentioned to me about um, how it had shocked you, how much celebrities were treated differently and that somebody like your dad couldn't recognize that, that, you know. No, I mean, I, it's. Ugh. um yeah well you know when I was taking some time to really move away from everything um you know I do dug a little deeper into some more culty type things I suppose like there's a fabulous um documentary called The Vow and um about um Nexium Nexium thank you and they have a podcast a little bit culty. And then, you know, I watched some movies about North Korea and I thought, whoa, <laughs> you know, so I'm unraveling my own um, mind. And sorry, what did you just ask me? Uh, I know I have a point to that. Yeah. And the love bombing. Okay. Love bombing is they love bomb celebrities so much and give them special treatment. I mean, we know all the stories of Tom Cruise up lines with the hangers and the cars and the basketball courts and all that kind of stuff. And they're not treated the same as a Sea Org member or a public um, because they're a celebrity. And I think this is shocking, actually. And, you know, um, um, I think it pisses a lot of people off, you know, like Tom Cruise getting that award. You know, um, I know that there were a lot of Sea Org members who were like, hey, I've worked for 25 years for, you know, $2,000. I should get that award, <laughs> you know. What about, um, what about Kate Severano? Did you see her enjoying some of these perks? No, absolutely. I remember at some point during the CC days at the, um, in L.A., when they were renovating that building and they really wanted to um, make it a, a haven for celebrities. Um, it was, oh, you're Kate Sobrano's cousin. So you're the entourage. So you get special treatment because you're the entourage. This was, you know, I know my story is a little confusing with the back and forth and the, in the Sea Org and out of the Sea Org and in Australia and in LA, but it is, it is a little complicated, but um, at that time I was public and it was like, oh, you get the nice treatment from everybody and you don't have to wait in a line or, you know, you'll get a better discount. I don't know. It's just, I mean, I know there's this old school thing. I don't think Hubbard would, I just don't think Hubbard would have liked that. I, I mean, I don't know who knows. What, who cares? Well, I but, mean, Project Celebrity was his idea in 1955. He 
he, was it? He, he wanted them to bring celebrities in because he knew I mean, one of the, you know, one of the simplest things about Scientology is that you're not supposed to talk about Scientology. And so since they can't yes. describe it, since they can never say anything, he knew that it would be better to have these ornaments that like Tom Cruise, you know, he was envisioning like Danny Kaye back in his day, uh, that wouldn't have to say a word. They would just be there and you'd be like, oh, well, it must be all right there in it. And of course, then if you ask them celebrities anything, they always say, oh, just get a book, read it. Book, read a book. Your life. You know, yeah. they never, they'll never say, well, you know, uh, it really helps to go five or six lifetimes back and remove some of these excess alien beings attached to you because that'll really make your day a lot better. You know, they can't say that, even though that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, so, you know, Hubbard knew that if just by the their presence that the celebrities would make Scientology yes. look less weird. All right. I, I understand people's obsession with celebrity and I get that if a celebrity says something is good, a lot of people go out and buy it. I understand that. I think it's, um, I'm sorry, I'm just getting over a sickness. So if I cough, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> no, I just find it, um, the obsession hilarious and it, my parents are obsessed with Kate and they're obsessed with Tom. Like every Tom movie, it's like Tom's movie. I was telling my father about the handmaid's tale. And I was like, it's a pretty dark story. Um, you know, Margaret Atwood was quite a writer of her day. And she had some really interesting, you know, utopian type concepts. And he's like, well, that sounds, you know, pretty dark and i was like well elizabeth moss is in it and he's like oh well i better watch it then and you know it's just like <laughs> come on wow <laughs> um yeah i don't so that and i also think um you know the I, you know there's a similarity between you know, I was watching the Nexium documentary. I'm sorry. And I that guy, what's his name? Keith Rainier. Rainier. Yeah. And I'm watching him like with his headband on and he said his volleyball games and he's got his harem of women and he's doing somersaults in like karate and all these silly things. And I literally think of like David Miscavige in that same way. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just like with his tips of his bleached hair and you know, his fancy suits and stuff and his little entourage. Like what, why is it like that when you have a cult in this cult leader or whatever it is that you're following around? Well, with, both, they... Hubbard, with both Hubbard and, and Miscavige, I've long felt, because people will always ask me, you know, um, was Hubbard a con man or did he believe in what he was doing yeah. and i came to the conclusion a long time that the answer is both that yeah. that you know he had to know that there was nothing to you right. know especially if you watch those early lectures and i've i mean i've read hundreds of his early lectures mm. he's he's messing with them He's like mm -hmm. challenging them to, you know, I, I really fight back like his was, concepts. He was like, right? you know, he was, he knew he was messing with people, but at some level, and also like with Miscavige, he knows the real numbers. He knows they're not expanding. He knows all the stuff he says is garbage. So there's that con man side of it where these are the only guys that really know the real numbers, the real, that what they're saying is garbage. So they have to know that they're lying. Okay. That's on one level. On the other yeah. level, you know, Hubbard was trying to find BTs at the end of his life. And Miscavige had copper rods installed because he was worried about, you know, discharging charge. And then he, you know, supposedly believed that BTs come off of children more easily. So he didn't like to be around kids. So I, I, oh, at wow. some level, they kind of believe this stuff. But I think they have to know that what they're saying is just nonsense and that they're harming people. So then you're saying that they're just sociopaths then? I think they're megalomaniacs and that they, you know, people, the other thing people ask me is, is what kind of succession plan does Dave have? And I said, none, right. of course, megalomaniacs never spend 
a second in their lives ever thinking about them not being in control. You know, Ron had no plan for who was going to come after him. He didn't, he never, you know, he, he just, it, that's why it became just this free for all. And Dave won out because right. he was the most ruthless. And, uh, and he's, I'm sure he's not, the only thing he's doing is anybody he felt that had any kind of challenging stature to him, he just got rid of them. Right. They all got sent right. to the hole or Shelly got yeah. sent to Twin Peaks. Yeah. The, yeah the, uh, Mike and um, the, they got sent to the hole. Yeah. yeah. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it's it, he, he's. He, so what do you think will happen when when he's done? His days are done. That's you know, it's a good question. I I, I, I feel that. Um, he knows that the, the, the um, membership has been dwindling. And I think, the, and and so on the one hand, what he's been trying to do since, you know, the early 2000s is focus mm -hmm. on this idea of expansion by providing real buildings to prove that it's happening. And that's the Ideal Org program, and it's all a jog and pony show for the donors. You don't think that that's purely financial? I, you know, this idea that it's a, that it's a real estate venture, I don't, I, I mean... Clearly, they they have an incredible they have, have incredible amounts of money and a lot of it's in land, but um, you know some of these purchases are insane. They're paying absolutely top dollar for that for buildings that will be difficult to yeah. reuse by somebody else. So I don't think it's all or to fill with people at all, right? So yeah, I you know so so for the last twenty years he's focused on this visual program of proving to these donors that things are going on but he has to know that things are dwindling and i just think that he i knows. think that people know that i think scientologists that are still in think that i i think my dad even mentioned that to me really like why can't yeah like why can't the suppressive just leave us alone we're already shrinking you know poor little us um wow. kind of a thing wow they're not and, supposed to admit that yeah i i know but I mean, come on now. Everybody who's ever been to an event knows those numbers are falsely put, turned upwards. And the mega drama with the voices and the, the you know, <laughs> the balloons and all the fireworks and the, the 5Xing. And I mean, it's like that every time. So, you know, come on now. It can't be. People aren't that dumb. Are they? Not really. People must know that what they see and what they hear are two different things. Well, let me things. ask you this. With your dad, do you think it's that he's still holding on to sort of like L. Ron Hubbard's ideas are going to win the day and maybe Dave's not doing the yeah. best job? Yeah. It's yes. not specifically yes. a loyalty to Dave? For example, bef before I got declared, I think I watched the Anderson Cooper uh you know, with the beating up and the women who were like, I know every inch. We call it the inch wives episode. Okay. Right? <laughs> okay. I saw that and I was like, what? And I called my dad and I was like, dad, I just saw this thing on Anderson Cooper. And it's not even like, you know, it's just a straight up news show. Yeah. Of David Miscavige beating people. And he was like, oh no, 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 no. There's no way. And if that's true, I'm going to be pissed and I'm out of here. And so he was like, I'm going to go find the truth. Wow. And I said, okay, cool. Let me know what you find. And then I get a call like a week later and he's like, I found the truth. You need to come with me. And I was like, well, why don't you come to my house? He's like, no, the truth can't leave this room. You have to come to me. It's um, you're going to be briefed on what's really going on. And I was like, okay. So I have to go down to the HGB. They take me into this room and they open up these binders. And um, th this was gross, but it was basically uh, Mike Rinder and Marty Rathbun's OW write-ups, uh, you know, to dead agent. Like, you know, it's, they're making up the lies of David so, Miscavige. So to translate, like, to, translate uh, to the non-Scientologist, yeah. Um, when you're a Scientologist, and I, I just got, I've just been reading some of Hubbard's 1962 writings, which is when he was really on top, really just 
everything was OWs. Everything was OWs. He was just like, yeah, the secret to everything in the world is withholds. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, the misunderstood word right before it. Right? OW stands for overts and withholds, meaning overts are, are, are bad acts that you commit and withholds are secrets that you keep. And so right. uh, in 62, what he's saying is he's, I figured out the problem because there's people that are not going clear. There's people that are held up. It's always because of a missed withhold. What that means mm -hmm. is when you're sitting there with the cans and the e-meter, you have not revealed some secret. And see, it's so convenient. It's such a convenient thing because they always say the technology, no, every, the Scientology always works unless always. you're doing it wrong. Now, um, Ron was or saying- you have present time overts. Now, right? Ron was saying Scientology always works, but if it doesn't, you're holding back a secret. So he puts yes. it on you. Exactly. And uh, so so Scientologists then get in the practice of having to sit down and write out these bad things they've done and secrets that they've kept. Mm -hmm. It's basically making people confess things mm -hmm. and then they're kept forever in their file. So then, mm -hmm. you know, Marty Rathbun and Mike Rinder, uh, as a matter of course, would have been told mm -hmm. to sit down and write, oh, I thought bad things about Dave or I did this or that. And that's on file. And mm -hmm. so now, now that Marty and Mike are on TV saying that David Miscavige is beating people, they mm -hmm. have you come down to read their actual confessionals. Yes. Which are supposed to be confidential, right? Yeah. I was so disgusted. I pushed the, the binder back and said, I'm not reading that. Like that, if, if, if you're going to, like, that's, I thought that was privileged stuff. It, and, you know, apparently like with every, confessional they say i'm not auditing you and then basically that means that it's not private but whatever i just thought it was snake snaky like why why you gotta throw their dirt out in the open i find that actually more disgusting than what any of those things could have said in that binder that you were going to show me and i'm not interested in reading it like you know um but how why do we get on that conversation because oh, that's great no that's a great scene i mean that's really important that when you saw marty and mike on anderson cooper revealing that david miscavige beat people mm -hmm. they brought you down oh that's right you their yeah. private confessionals which they were forced to write anyway that's these are Correct. not like these are not like and you know you know, well, they, they decided to get some things off their chest. No, you yeah, have to write those as a matter of course. You, Correct. You're forced. And then it's kept. And then it's just shown to Trish Conley because she has some questions. It's so gross. Incredible. I mean, <laughs> yeah. To call yourself um, a church when you're doing things like that makes my mind blown. I just don't, I can't comprehend why that would Anyway, I mean, you know, it's disgusting. But for your dad, it's like, oh, okay, that explains everything. Exactly. It's exactly. Look, they had evil thoughts. They were lying about their stats. And I'm, I mean, I'm thinking, yeah, because they're stressed out because they can't make these stats do anything. <laughs> so everyone who's ever been in the Sea Org has lied on their stats at some point <laughs> because the pressure is so intense to make it go up or whatever. You know, it's like, it's always got to be up, 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 which well, is impossible and also, in life. Also, you're taught that you're not going to progress until you get off these withholds. So they're told mm -hmm. that unless they can come up with something, that they've done, they're not never going to uh, advance. This is why, you know, every once in a while, I hear from somebody saying, oh, so-and-so, did you know that so-and-so in the Sea Org, we understand that he admitted to X, Y, and Z, and therefore he's a child molester or something. And I'm always like, wait a minute, you can't yeah. trust Scientology confessions. Right. Give me a break. And, you know, right. that's, I, I really don't like this trend. Yes. Where people are being accused of things. Well, we know it's true because they said it in, in uh, you know, in a, in a Un sec check. Uh, yeah. If they said it Under in a pressure. sec check, it's got to be okay. true. You know, right. like, no, it's not necessarily true. In Scientology, if you don't dream up something bad that you've done, you're not going to move forward. And you're not getting out of that session either until you, you know, cough it up.
whatever, even if there's nothing. And I always thought it was interesting too, because I, I, and this is, you know, part of unraveling the onion, as they say is, you know, um, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, Hubbard said, um, oh my gosh, sorry. Well, you just said something that I was like, I've got a great point here. And then I'm sex checking and confessionals and, uh, um, that you, you know, that, that people have to, you know, basically Uh, under the pressure. Yeah. To get it off. Um, uh, sorry. It it came and went so (laughs) fast. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) You said it was something Hubbard said. Oh my goodness. That's a lot of stuff. Hubbard said a lot of things, didn't he? I know. Well, let me ask you about that. Let me ask you about that. So you grew up in it. You mm-hmm. went through all this trouble with your family and getting disconnected and all. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like to ask people about what it was like to try to get out of that thinking. And and how many years later did you realize that you were still putting things through a kind of Scientology lens and catching yourself? Yeah. And uh, you know, yeah. I don't have to think that way anymore. And was that going on for you for a long time? Are you kidding? Yes. A long time. Um, you know, I would say 10 years, you know, to be fully un indoctrinated and, and think, um, you know, like reading other philosophies and learning uh, about, you know, psychology and like really studying what other people said, like, it's insane that Scientologists only want to know what one man from 1950 said. And there is a lot of incredible information in the world. And yeah, it, um, it does take time. Like, you know, we, when you're a child in Scientology and you run around and you hit your toe, you're automatically thinking, I got to touch it back, you know, a touch assist or, or, you know, a contact assist or whatever it is. Like just the little triggers of things like that, or, you know, you're sick. Oh, I must be PTS. Who is it? Like all those things take, or if I did something bad, it's because of a missed withhold, because of a a misunderstood word, because of a whole track, you know, like you've got to, to really be free of it and be like, actually, no, I, those things are not true and not real. And there are so many other incredible things like, you know, anyway, I could just go on about. Well, um, you, like you, when you were declared, your daughter was 13 and you said that already at that point, she didn't really have much of a relationship with her, with her grandparents. No. I'm curious when it came time, what was it like explaining to her what you had been through and why her, she never heard from her grandparents and, was that a gradual process? Was that something that took, took a you, long time? You know, she she and I have a very, very close, open relationship. And um, recently, you know, I never raised her in Scientology. She never, you know, she went to Delphi for a little bit when she was younger. Uh, but the minute, you know, I think in 2005, seven, I was like, nope, nothing. Um, we're, we're going. But um she said to me, you know, mom, because when I was trying to rekindle with my parents, I was like, Madison, come on, let's FaceTime with them or let's, they want to know how you're doing and da, 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 da. And she was like, no, I don't want to talk to them. And I was like, why are you resisting this? And she's like, mom, I saw you when they disconnected from you hit the floor and you were so hurt back then. Like, I don't owe them anything. And in fact, I'm so angry that you could be treated like that. So she knew back then, and now as adults, we're talking about it. Um, And it's really fascinating her perspective now from never being in, but both me and her father were Scientologists and both of us are out. Um, we're divorced, but you know, we both decided not to raise her in Scientology and all those things. And this kid is um remarkable. You know, in fact, um 
she was she, when she was in high school she went to a school called new roads which is in santa monica and they steven spielberg donated a big theater there it's like a pretty it's a private school it's pretty hoity-toity and we get a you know email from the school one day saying um Friday night, um, Kim Mathers from NPR and um, uh, Lawrence Wright are doing a thing on the stage. Come on, everybody in. And I was like, oh, my God, like no degrees of separation here. Like Lawrence Wright's at my daughter's school. And, you know, I got his book and told him that I used to be a Scientologist. And he's like, stay clear, Trish, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so it's, um, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm really glad to hear that you, you and she are doing so well. And, um, you know, I've heard from a number of people. They just hope someday your parents figure things out, you know, and, uh, actually but... I don't, I can't play that game anymore, Tony. It just pulls on my heart too much. Yeah. I'm a big, uh, softy and, um, I just can't do it. So when my sister and I wrote that letter, we're done. And I know that sounds cold, but it's actually just for, for our survival, actually, to be able to thrive now. It's really important. So I don't think so. Well, and I think it's okay. I, you got a lot of people rooting for you, Trish, and I, we're grateful that you've, uh, talk to us and like i said i got a lot i heard a lot of things last week and i expect i'll hear a lot now and i'm just so grateful that you've come to talk to me at the underground yeah Bumble. thank you for having me okay <laughs> it's always good to talk thanks a lot trish we'll talk to you later bye tony bye